Yeah, good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining after the big lunch break. Never had the experience having lunch with a glass of champagne. That's only possible in Paris, and uh, I think it's the right way to enjoy a conference. And uh, for me, it's a, it's a great honor and pleasure today to host, um, I think, a fantastic panel about blockchain and Bitcoin, about the current state and what's coming down the road. Uh, because we have here, and it's really uh, hard to find, two leading blockchain uh, platform providers. We have um, a leading VC company in the blockchain business. We have uh, a startup out of the cryptocurrency area that did uh, a very successful ICO. And uh, uh, we have with uh, Settle also a company that's providing blockchain solutions. So, Joe, if you want to start first introducing yourself and uh, uh, what do you do? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Oliver, uh, panel. Um, so my background is mostly technology, a little bit of finance. Uh, I did a decade of uh, uh, software engineering, uh, robotics, machine vision, AI work. Um, spent a little time at the Goldman Sachs company and transitioned at that point to the world of finance. I was involved in uh, running a hedge fund. Um, became aware of the, block, the, the Bitcoin space uh, early on, uh, but uh, for various reasons, I, I was fascinated by the technology, became expert in the technology, uh, but didn't want to uh, commit myself to 16-hour days, six and a half days a week. Um, <laughs> uh, it was a, an immature space at that point. Uh, when I read uh, Vitalik Buterin's white paper describing the Ethereum platform, it described a scalable way in terms of human resources um, to bring the promise of the blockchain, uh, the promise of Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper uh, to the world. Um, instead of just a single money application on this new trustworthy infrastructure, um, Vitalik described a way where you didn't need protocol priests to build one use case at a time, and millions of average software developers around the world could identify their own problems and build their own solutions. So I uh, jumped onto that project in the very early days. A year later, I started a company called Consensus. Uh, to continue the vision of the Ethereum project and platform. Uh, we operate along five prongs of activity. We build a lot of infrastructure for the Ethereum ecosystem. We build core components like identity, reputation, decentralized governance, accounting, uh, and we build uh, north of 25 protocol-based open platforms. We can talk a bit about some of those yeah. going on. Or, um, we do enterprise and government consulting. We do. Uh, education in the form of Consensus Academy, and we do a few different capital markets activities. And I think you have 500 employees, is that correct, roughly? Uh, that was this morning. We're at 6.15 right now, actually. Wow. That's the, okay. <laughs> Thank you. David, David Rother from um, CEO of R3, yeah. if you want to yeah, introduce it's, yourself. It's actually 6.16 now, Joe. 6.16. 6 <laughs> so I'm David Rutter. I'm the founder and CEO of R3, which is an enterprise software company that has built a platform called Corda, that is specifically designed for the you know, very uh, high uh, requirements and standards for regulated financial firms, specifically to support high value transactions. Um, my experience, I've been in finance for 32 years. For the 10 prior years uh, before starting R3 in September 2015, I was the CEO of a couple big uh, OTC exchanges in U.S. Treasuries called BrokerTech. Many of you will be aware uh, with it. They're also uh, in involved in the EGB market as well and in the spot FX world, EBS. So I had uh, many years of experience in trying to introduce new technologies to banks and uh, you know, build an appreciation for how difficult and challenging that can be. So. When we were inspired, as Joe mentioned, by some of the technologies that came before, including uh, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, um, IBM's fabric was then called, I think, Blue Chain or something like that. Open blockchain. O open, open blockchain. blockchain? Okay. That's what it was called? Okay. There you go. So uh, we had a chance <laughs> to kind of look at those technologies and then work with what is a large network of banks. We have... 40-some banks as investors. We have a partner network of financial institutions and, and uh, you know, regulators and, and partners of over 200 firms now um, focused on designing and building the, the platform for, for the future of finance in the cloud, essentially. And uh, Oliver, thank you for uh, hosting yeah, today, and I'm glad to join this uh, panel. Excellent. Now we have Julian Hoss, Chairman 10X, uh, out of Singapore. 
So I'm Julian. I'm the co-founder and president of 10X. I learned about cryptocurrencies in 2014. I have a completely different background. I come out of medicine. I studied medicine, worked as a surgeon. And um, that non-business, non-tech, non-finance kind of transudes through the entire company. Um, at 10X, we want to make cryptocurrencies usable, spendable. Uh, we offer a debit card where people can connect different cryptocurrencies to. They only need one card, one app, and then they can just go and spend their Bitcoin, Ether, Dash, tokens, and so on, online, offline, all around the world. So for us, it's really about usability. Um, we do a lot of education for the ecosystem, especially in the German markets, but also internationally. We have this hashtag called CryptoFit to make people fit in crypto, because I believe there's so much misunderstanding, and this kind of keeps, on the one hand, banks and regulators from being open in this space, and it keeps a lot of people from actually using these opportunities. Um, yeah. So, Thank pleasure you, to be on this panel. Thank you, Julian. <coughs> Michael? Hi, my name is Michael Jackson. I'm from Mangrove Capital from Luxembourg, which is a fairly traditional venture investor, having been investing in venture for 15, 17 years now. Um, my own background, though, is from telecoms, where I was head of operations, COO for Skype for the first four years of its existence, and saw how that pretty much wrecked the, some of the business models of the existing telecoms providers. And I'm intrigued to see how this is going to happen through the new generation of distributed technology as it affects the finance system. So first place it's going to hit me is probably at home in people raising capital through venture capital. So I thought, well, we better get on and investigate that. So we've got a team of people investing in the space. Uh, we wrote a report back in October, which was the first report on ICO. showed that if you just randomly spread your money on ICO, you'd have made a 1,300 and 13, 1,320 times re uh, return on your money, which... Uh, would have been great if it had really been realistic, but, but there we are. Um, and I'm also on the board of uh, blockchain.com and a couple of other crypto companies. Thank you. Peter? Hi, um, I'm Peter Randall, uh, CEO of Settle. Um, previous life, I was the founder and first chief executive of a business called uh, Chiax, which uh, brought 21st century technology and 21st century engineering to the trading space. Uh, recently sold, the, that whole business was sold uh, to CBOE for 3.2 billion, um, having been founded with 25 million. The observation there was that by putting really good modern technology into industries that still ran basically COBOL on mainframes, you could make a real difference. Settle is all about making that difference in what we think is now the most exciting space, which is the post-trade space. Post-trade is dominated still, as most people are aware, by COBOL on mainframes. We can do again to the post-trade space what we were able to do with uh, Chiax in the trading space. You've got to do that in a very specific way. You've got to have chain which is highly compatible with the way in which financial institutions work. So it's got to be ISO 27001. It's got to have all the sorts of necessary cybersecurity stuff. Interestingly, it's got to be very cheap. And it's got to be delivered in a way that is going to make a big, a big difference to the institutions that are using it. Our first chain uh, that uh, you will probably come across, and we're very excited about this, is <coughs> a business called Isness in France uh, with the asset managers. Uh, which uh, seeks to disintermediate uh, the transfer agents and really make a difference to the way in which records are kept in this space. That, I think, by the end of the year, will have somewhere in the region of between 800 billion and a trillion euros of assets on it. That will make it, ladies and gentlemen, mm -hmm. the biggest chain in the world much bigger than all the cryptocurrencies added together. So it's a very exciting time. That's a single asset. We've got the same thing happening in Luxembourg. We've got the same thing happening in many other jurisdictions as well. Very, very exciting. Thank you. Okay, Peter. Um, I think we have two themes today about blockchain and the cryptocurrency ICO space. Let me start with the, uh, the blockchain space. And, and maybe, David, um, maybe if you can start, you know, what is hot in 2080, meaning, you know, we've been through a lot of POCs and, and, and uh, labs and yeah. uh, um, networks and business networks coming up. What is real? What's coming into production this year from, a, uh, from our three perspective? And then I will ask you, Joe, the same question from a theorem perspective. Because I think there's a race now into production 2018. 
Yeah, so, so uh, you know, the, it's not that the POC is dead. There's still a lot of work being done, but we're definitely spending our resources focusing on a production environment. Um, many of those POCs graduated to pilot. They've done live transactions, but in the pilot environment, which is a very controlled environment. Mm -hmm. So at R3, we're spending a lot of time focusing on thinking about what that operating environment looks like. Um, because I, you know, as a CEO of a couple exchanges, I have appreciation for the type of support model that's demanded by the customers that we intend to face. Um, so we're spending a lot of time thinking about that. There's going to be more about that later this year. We call that uh, Corda Connect. Um, there's about a hundred apps that I know of that are being built on top of Corda at the moment. There's a number of them that are going live in the next six months. So 2018 is the year of production for sure. Um, so, so first app for us is going live in about two months. So, so out of the hundred, is there a killer, killer app out there? Well, you know, one of the things which I should have checked with the PR people because I'm pretty sure it's public <laughs> is uh, we're working with a large software um, provider that is uh, porting their bespoke mm -hmm. um, product to the cloud on top of Corda, and that's Finastra and something called uh, Lendercom, which is mm -hmm. their syndicated loan. Um, solution, and I pray to God that's been announced. But the uh, so we're excited about that because it's an existing business that wants to take advantage of uh, Corda to to safely and securely move their kind of bespoke implementations into the cloud and add additional services mm -hmm. on top. But there's also stuff in uh, FX settlement, uh, in in high quality liquid assets uh, uh, businesses we're pretty excited about, which allows for the swapping of different uh, securities. Joe, from an Ethereum perspective, I think the Ethereum Alliance, uh, Enterprise Alliance, has over 600, 800 members already. It's growing rapidly. Three, 350, but thank you. 350, okay. Um, <laughs> uh, projecting for 2018, maybe. Uh, what do you think is it's a hot topic for your community this year? Production um, uh, use cases that you think will uh, be in high demand and also in, in uh, um, generating impact? And because at the end, we, we get uh, incentivized to do uh, revenue or... Uh, um, efficiency grow, um, gains through those kind of technology. Yeah, so we operate along two major prongs of activity. Mm -hmm. um, so similar to, to David's company, uh, we do a lot of work, uh, consulting work, mm -hmm. uh, on private permissioned versions of the Ethereum technology. Uh, so uh, you'll see a bunch of supply chain work. We're doing supply chain work. We've got a supply chain product. We'll see uh, land title, uh, KYC, uh, in that private space. But uh, our larger prong of activity is on the public blockchain, uh, and we can move the different components between the two. So uh, on the public blockchain, uh, we've seen uh, gold 2.0 become interesting to many portfolios around the world. Uh, with the advent of the futures contracts, you can achieve exposure to uh, the price of cryptocurrencies um, without uh, custody risk and minimized counterparty risk, and uh, we're gonna see uh, that get fleshed out a little bit with deliverable uh, forward contracts at some point quite soon. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one killer app. Uh, the token launch is a killer app. Uh, we have issued tokenized securities. We funded an independent film, um, just got invited to the Tribeca Film Festival, uh, and we've done a lot of utility tokens that uh, represent membership, consumer access, uh, consumption of scarce resources, and we're getting <coughs> comfort that uh, securities regulators around the world understand that those aren't securities. So our lawyers are sleeping well But I think night. you're bringing up a good topic, and I will ask Peter in a minute about that, is um, uh, private and, and public ledger. No? Because I think what you see, there's a lot of investments in going into the public area, um, uh, tokenization of assets, etc. Working with your corporate clients, is that a topic? Or is that, uh, you know, we heard the, the, the governor from uh, uh, France today that, you know, the whole token cryptocurrency is a, is a taboo still. Uh, do you see there's a change uh, going on in the financial service community, or sure. do you think it's still a very protected private environment? Uh, it's, uh, it's a huge, exciting topic for, for many um, different actors in our space and also uh, more traditional entities uh, like central banks. They're starting yeah. to wrap their head around the yeah. idea of issuing a, mm -hmm. a tokenized uh, uh, national uh, value. Uh, value token. Um, so ab absolutely, there are, um, quote, legacy companies moving into our space. Um, 
we're seeing different applications that are going to go live this year. We're seeing different components like price stable tokens, uh, like atomic swap exchanges, like asset backed tokens. That's going to be very big this year. Um, we're going live with a decentralized professional journalism platform. Uh, we may have some uh, mm -hmm. announcements of major um, journalism entities that will get involved with that. We're also going live tokenizing real estate on the blockchain. Um, one of the mechanisms that enables that is a project called Open Law, uh, where we are starting to use uh, hybrid blockchain-based legally enforceable agreements. Uh, so these are agreements that can have normal pros clauses, but also clauses uh, that are programs on the blockchain that you can escrow money into, that you can send data into, that can act uh, in different ways upon conditions being met. Peter, do you see that also these kind of hybrid models at the end? No? Uh, is, is it coming up in the, in the financial service industry, or are we uh, five years away from that? Oliver, it's uh, depressing to me to hear the sort of blockchain bingo that uh, most people seem to want to, to hide behind. Okay, explain to, more. In order to uh, escape from the obvious conclusions. And the obvious conclusions are pretty straightforward, that if you're moving important things like money or assets, you want to be able to be sure very clearly and very simply that you know where they came from, they know where they're going to, you know the people who are transacting them. That means clearly, simply, it has got to be in a permission chain. It cannot be in an open or a public blockchain. It cannot be done. That's not possible in any shape, manner, or form. So quite categorically, if you do this in a permission chain, you get some real advantages. You get advantages around consensus. You get advantages around speed. And you get advantages particularly around capacity. So these are all really, yeah. really yeah. vital things. Not things that we can just sort of so, or say, oh, brush under the table and we'll have another session of blockchain bingo. But the most important thing is to really focus on what is needed. Yeah. And what is needed is quite straightforward, something which you can ultimately take before a judge. And judges, to be really clear, I don't think anybody in this room will ever believe you if you ever think that a judge will take a line of code and say, you know what? Yep, that is a valid Java command, because they don't. Judges only ever deal with very straightforward things, mm -hmm. like what was written down, what did the parties agree? Do, do you End agree? And then, uh, um, Joe, I agree with a, a good amount of that. Um, right from the start of the Ethereum project, um, we felt that many of the use cases, virtually all of the use cases, would benefit from disclosed identity and rich reputation. Um, our company consensus is not focused on cryptocurrencies. We're not focused on anonymity. We're not even focused on pseudonymity. Uh, we built a very rich identity platform. It's got an associated reputation system. Uh, Zug in Switzerland uh, is starting to use it to enable uh, their citizens to access government services. We're using it in many of our different applications. Um, I completely agree uh, that uh, uh, if you're doing certain kinds of transactions entering into certain kinds of agreements. Uh, there should be an arbitration system that enables you to deal with edge cases in mm -hmm. those systems and uh, everything falls back to the legal industry, um, the legal infrastructure, um, because you're gonna have disclosed identity, you're gonna be uh, interacting Good. with institutions that are in jurisdictions and everybody yeah. uh, is gonna be playing So June, do, 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 do you, what, what's your viewpoint? What's hot for you this year and uh, I, I can imagine in so a crypto one, one more yeah. important point <laughs> can I, is that on a permissionless yeah. uh, blockchain infrastructure, you can build permission systems, and we're doing a lot of that. I think that there will be both a uh, hybrid model from my perspective. But I think let's move on uh, a little bit, um, Julian, from your perspective. What, what do you what's 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 on on the agenda? What do you see this year um, uh, in your space, especially uh, from a financial service perspective? I mean. <clears throat> on the one hand, I want to comment on there maybe on one thing. I, I agree with some things um, Peter said. I disagree with, and I disagree strongly with, that a judge in the future might uh, not be able to comment on a line of code. Um, I think today, 10 years ago, with social media today, there's completely new options on what, how the legal system works, what stalking, for example, means on social media. Um, social media harassing hasn't been there 15 years ago, so the judge, the, the legal system always evolves, and I think 
probably in 15 years, um, the way, I don't know, financial crime is going to be done and, and, and pursued is going to be completely different to how it is today. So I just want to add something there. Maybe what I see for 2018, um, <clears throat> so obviously I think the major thing 2018 is going to be to decentralize a lot of the companies a bit, uh, meaning giving the users the power of storing their own uh, private key, but then still having access to all these services. So for example, at the moment at 10x, you have to trust 10x if you want to use our card, for example. So you can't just, you can't own the private key for yourself and then spend that money. Now, 2018, the goal would be that you control your private key, you own those coins, they're in a payment channel, and in that moment when you actually swipe your card, the card, what it basically does is it updates the state of the payment channel, and we as a company are allowed to kind of update that and, and take money out of that channel. And I think you, Julian, let me say, Julian, I think what you're pointing out is I think it's an important statement, I think, um, because beside the technology discussion, what I see, and then please, uh, uh, Michael, also from your perspective, I think we're moving into also business model discussion because 20 years ago, with all the internet players coming up, they're setting up a new market structure with players, etc. That whole market structure, the, the middleman dealing between the buyer and seller across all industries, that model is being questioned through these decentralized business models. Yeah. And I think that's a fundamental change beside all the technical uh, technology discussion that we have is um, that I see, and I'd like to get a confirmation on that, a lot of what discussion now thinking about what is the implication, what does it mean for my business, where should I play? Michael, I do you see that? Yeah, oh, Julian. Maybe I can just yeah, jump, yeah. Uh, throw something in there. I think so far for the past, I don't know, probably 2,000 years, 4,000 years, we've only seen centralized yeah. business models, centralized solutions. And now in the last five years, I mean, it started 2009, but let's say the last four or five years, we've seen this big push into decentralization. Everyone thinks decentralization is the future, mm -hmm. but no one wants a situation where no one is in charge, where there's pure chaos, where there's anarchy. <clears throat> no one wants that. So the future is gonna be to find that golden, the, that Goldilocks zone in the middle, and I think no one today knows what is this perfect middle scenario, uh, and, and that is my vision a bit for the future. So it's not going to be centralization, it's not decentralization, it's that best out of both worlds. Michael, is yeah, I mean, also at the moment, our custodial banking system is based on one entity holding your money, and a yeah. lot of even the cryptocurrency side is still based around that model. If one of those, those entities goes under, then you lost your money because you've essentially given them your, 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 your currency. The whole idea of much of the crypto side was you kept it in your own wallet, but that's unmanageable because there's no recourse, there's, there's all sorts of problems with that. You get, you get held up by a bank robber and all of these stories just yesterday even. There was another one of those even in, in rural England, which was somewhat shocking. Um, but what we're going to see is, is third-party validation systems, service provision, uh, frameworks on, on top of that, which allow, can allow people to manage and control their, their currencies and their assets a lot more under their own control than they have now. So you could have four or five different service providers managing identity, four or five different service providers managing, managing transfers, for example, and you can choose which one of those providers you want to use at any particular time. Middlemen world is, is kind of dead, uh, where you've got a middleman who kind of has to be in that, and these centralized exchanges we've seen in the financial world, mm. I find them challenged because they don't really add a lot of value when it can be done in a decentralized way. Yeah. I mean, just, so just, just in my past, we were, we were running an a, a, a internet calling system, Skype, with 160 million users, now a billion users, yeah. and there was no central infrastructure on that. It was all run by code. And judges could arbitrate on that I thing. I, I completely agree with, the, with, the, with Julian. So before view. I go to Peter, one, one provocative question to you, Michael. You know, if we look at new decentralized business model coming up, is your business, the VC business, going forward obsolete with ICOs coming up? I don't think it's obsolete, obsolete but it needs to find its way, right? My, my view is that fundraising for a company now is a tortuous affair. You have to take your little pitch deck and you have to hawk it around all the people you maybe know and maybe don't and kind of hope for the best. Um, but particularly if you've got a business model which, which will appeal to a broad variety of, of consumers or business people, you can gather funds from those in a controlled way through an ICO, through the, the contract mechanism you can do it. And, and I completely disagree with the, with the concept that it's Wild West. It, it needs regulation, but yeah. a lot of the regulation yeah. we have now completely exists. Mm. It's here today. Yeah. It's not been enforced, but it's here. If you go cheating people, you go to prison. Yeah. I mean, that's it. So, so what you're saying, and that, I think this is an important statement, 
What you're saying is we're going to a business model change into a decentralized. And we have already few examples like VC business. It's already happening. So it's not 10 years out there. Absolutely. These changes happen okay. fast because the innovation speed of a new company is forming yeah. every day. And if yeah. I'm starting a new company, I have two choices now. I can go to the VC or I can go and do, for example, ICO story or, so, or something so Peter, like that. Right? Let me ask Peter. So do you see that business model change? Do you have a discussion with you with in the industry like that? Yeah. Or is it, yeah. is it, I mean, is I think it just, um, just strategy I think discussion? Uh, very um, good question, uh, Oliver. seems to us very clearly that the business model of the future will evolve around or revolve around, if you will, three points. It's a three-pointed triangle. The top of the triangle, or one apex of the triangle, if you will, um, will be platforms that involve themselves in pricing and price discovery. At one corner of the triangle will be the issuers of assets. I don't think issuers of assets are going to go away soon. Governments are not going to stop borrowing. Companies are not going to stop wanting to be funded. There will be issuers. And those issuers will be looked after by their community, which are the registrars and all the rest of it. Mm. The broker-dealers, obviously, will look after price discovery. And then the final point of the triangle is the owners of assets. So there's an issuer of an asset, a pricer, and an owner. And the owners of assets will have their, if you will, helpers, and their helpers are called the asset managers. So you have people who are asset managers, you have people who are the registrars and the issuers, and you have people that are pricers. To borrow respectfully from Warren Buffett when he talks about people that are involved in the financial transactions. He calls them helpers. These are people that don't actually produce anything, they just move things from place to place to place. There's now no need for those helpers. A lot of the people that have provided services to the people that provide services can now go away. Okay. And that will be a very radical change in the pricing for how financial assets are traded and how financial assets are issued and owned. D David, and that's good. David, with your capital market background, do you see this kind of market structural changes or what's yeah, your... So, so I'll make a couple comments. Yeah. Uh, one is uh, I kind of agree with what we were talking about. You can support a decentralized model and still have an entity mm -hmm. or someone that's responsible. If you're going to be serving the market that we're serving, the banks want a throat to choke at the end of the day mm -hmm. if things go wrong. You know, as far as the ICO market and the venture market is concerned, I've been ridiculously negative on ICOs. I'm blown away by, by how you can raise hundreds of millions of dollars on a, on a white paper that doesn't even make technical sense in <laughs> many, and, and, has, and, and in some cases specifically states, we guarantee you nothing and we have nothing and, you know, send us, you crypto, you know, millionaires send us your coins and they raise $100 million. So, uh, and, and of course, if anyone's raised money, it's a really, from the venture world, it's actually a really miserable experience because they're quite good at what they do and they're going to challenge you and they need to see pro formas and they need to see, you know, responsible business plans. So here's the good news as, as much been as negative as you can on IC as you can on ICOs, but the reality is is that they're here to stay, and when these two extremes are going to kind of converge, they're gonna the IC ICOs will become better regulated yeah. as people begin to lose money on some of these ridiculous concepts. Although if you're about to start a company and you're in this crowd, don't go the venture route. Go to the IC route really quickly while you can. But over time, <laughs> you know, that threshold is going to uh, become similar to, to what you have there. And uh, again, the venture guys are going to have to evolve. Over time, the real threat could be to the, to the banks um, because for legitimate uh, issuance of, of government and corporate bonds and other securities, you know, using the ICO structure which will evolve, could, could be uh, a line of business. Let, me, let me ask Julian, because Julian did with 10x an ICO, located in Singapore, and the MD of the MIS last week said in a statement that they're really considering issuing a cryptocurrency, but they know if they do this, this will disintermediate the banks. That was his statement. Love to hear your view on that. I mean, I... I really agree with you, David, and I think many of us have a similar notion. Maybe we kind of talk a bit of the same coin from a different bit of an angle. I mean, we've raised $80 million in seven minutes. We could have received <laughs> $250 million in seven minutes. But, and here's the Why big didn't but. you run it for 14, man? Yeah, I should, huh? <laughs> no, not, I, not I think to mention the, the months of preparation is, before that. I think the key is, so we had 
a live product, we had users, we had a, we had a team. So I think we were a bit of the exception to the norm there. And um, we were not this kind of group that said, hey, here's a white paper, we got nothing, um, there's three people in a garage and let's, I don't know, risk it, right? I think for us it was quite uh, different there. Um, I, and and I, I also think that we're going to see, we are seeing already this mix of decentralization and centralization in ICOs. Um, today, ICOs are not decentralized anymore. These groups, they go to venture funds and say, okay, hey, I want to raise $25 million. Here's $5 million for you. Here's $5 million for you. $5 million for you. $5 million for you. And five stay for the actual public. So we're actually seeing this already. So yeah. it, 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 the funny thing is, you know, we talk about ICOs being completely decentralized, but all it does is it, it, it's the entire thing kind of rolled it's up again. But becoming more an IPO. Book building, pre-sales, etc. Like we I have mean, I, I would love to see this year. I mean, maybe we're going to see ICPOs. You know, like initial coin public offerings. Maybe there's going to be a, a crypto asset kind of uh, thing. Uh, with many regulators I speak, um, also with MAS in Singapore, we talk about how could you structure a crypto asset, a crypto security. I think that would be very interesting to see. What would be the rules? How, how could you yeah. be innovative in that sense? Quick answer. Yeah, so the space is already well regulated. Um, uh, it needs to be, it is starting to be enforced and needs uh, better enforcement. Uh, we're working with um, regulators around the world to help them understand the technology and uh, help us uh, understand their perspective and reduce our uncertainty. We, uh, um, we have been, um, we've developed deep expertise in uh, issuing tokenized securities. We funded an independent film that way, mm -hmm. uh, and utility tokens that wouldn't be deemed to be securities. And so uh, those are uh, access to scarce resources, membership, etc. Mm -hmm. um, it's important uh, to uh, progress this technology and, and using all the expertise from the VC industry, um, but not get to the point where uh, there's an investor class and then the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we believe that we will be able to offer certain kinds of projects that, that do um, sell tokens that have utility uh, as their primary focus and not uh, an investment as primary focus and mm -hmm. uh, enable um, the global community to have democratized okay. access to that. Very good. Michael and then Peter, um, what's your... But I can view. see this going even further beyond what we're doing now, which is raising yeah. capital for companies. But yeah. when this becomes, in a few years' time, a, a regular feature of day-to-day -day business life, we have bonds we can issue, we can issue shares and equity mm -hmm. and these yeah. kind of things. But small companies have a lot of difficulty, medium-sized companies issuing project financing and mm -hmm. things like that. Through the contract mechanisms and the visibility, perversely, that, that these systems can enable, um, we could all invest in some new project of a company knowing very well when we're going to get our money back and all of that and not need to go to a judge on it because the, the contract enforces it. And I think we can open up a tremendous world, a tremendous amount of capital yep. that's tied up today. Yeah, and um, let, me, let me Peter's the next, I'm sorry. I've just, I've, I've just, got, uh, I've just got two points, both of which uh, I think potentially are fatal for the ICO situation. The first one is that in any established sort of view of the world, um, effectively for the last 10 years or so, we've had virtually zero interest rates. There's been no re real return on real cash. Yeah. So I just asked myself the question, in the event of us returning to the normal cycle, which I suspect we will do, when interest rates start to tick up again and there is now returns on real cash, the attractions of currency, of ICO type activity, I think will wane very quickly. I think that if you think about other markets that have gone up very quickly and come down very quickly, the pattern is pretty clear. And we can go back to Germany in 2000 mm -hmm. and the Neumark, it's the same pattern. It looks identical. And I don't think there's anything different about it. Yeah. The second yeah. point, and it's very Thank important, you. the second yeah. point, is that with cryptocurrencies, there is no lender of last resort. And Always in financial markets, always in financial markets, there's a certain set of circumstances where lots of people have got assets, but there's no immediate liquidity. And where there is no immediate liquidity, things fail. They fall over. Not because there isn't the assets, but because there isn't the immediate liquidity. Now, we've solved that traditionally by having a central bank, which can create that asset. I do not believe, and we saw Vitalik Buterin actually put his own money up and, uh, under the DAO hack, I think, put his own money up to support as a lender of last resort. There has to be that element, and I haven't seen that mm. in any of the 
ICO activity at all mm. yet. David? So j just a couple of things. I don't think we'll have time to talk about it today, but we've probably done more work with central banks and looking at mm -hmm. issuance of fiat on ledger than anyone. We have a lot of research papers out there. We can talk about it at nauseum with MAS, BOJ, HKMA, and, and a bunch of others. But I told Joe I wanted to wind him up a little bit before uh, the panel. So, <laughs> Joe, you can't be serious that you think ICOs are not the Wild West right now. I might be misunderstanding what you're saying. I think that you guys have done some work about building the technical infrastructure, but if you think the SEC, CFTC, if the F FCA and, you know, BOJ and all the regulators around the world are on top of this uh, thing, I, I, I totally disagree with you. <laughs> uh, absolutely the Wild West. Okay. Um, so we... Um, a couple things are going on here. There's the, the trustful nature of the platform. There's low barrier to entry. Uh, that drives things like disintermediation when you um, avail or when, when they, you use those principles in a radically decentralized, radically free open market. So that's disintermediation. Um, that low barrier to entry, um, the global context um, of the blockchain and the massive information asymmetry uh, has been taken advantage of um, since the Wild West, uh, since thousands of years ago. There are always actors uh, who are interested in using information asymmetries to take advantage of people. Um, and so the beauty of uh, what we're uh, moving into is instead of having these siloed situations where you have bucket shops that are selling grandmother securities, um, we're gonna be able to access all of the information from these projects in the form of white papers. We're putting together an Edgar-like database in the form of uh, Project Masari um, to force these projects to disclose important information. We're building systems to incentivize analysts to do good work. So we can take advantage of the low barrier uh, to entry and the global context to put good information out there uh, for can I just uh, Can I just bring us back a little bit from the Wild West to, to, to Paris? because it's actually quite important that we're here in France and we, we should sort yeah. of try and think about what's going on here. And I think there's a very, very interesting opportunity starting to evolve, particularly in Paris, and particularly over the issues around Brexit. And it seems to me that Paris leads the world probably at the moment in the ability to be able to deliver more modern technology for financial services over and above what's going on in London. And I think the theme, my sense of it at least, okay. is that French institutions, French government, French support for these projects is very, very strong. And it seems to me that there's a very distinct possibility that that will mean that actually the history of the next 10 to 15 years will be dealing mm. with chains and will be dealing with businesses that are actually based in France, based in Paris. No longer necessarily in London, no longer necessarily in the United States. I think that the, the, the French opportunity is extremely interesting, and we should really I, focus I, on I it. I think from a European perspective, but Julian, if you look from a Singapore perspective, they have KYC, uh, AML, utility on blockchain, interbanking blockchain activities. Do you think also the Singapore government is very pushy, progressive on the whole blockchain uh, cryptocurrency space? I mean, we run a trial project right now even, where we analyze the coins that are being used to fund our wallet so that when you go and use our card, so we can actually give a risk score and how likely is it that the source of funding, which is like one of the key topics always in crypto, that that source of funding, how risky is that? How likely has that been being, was that being used in money laundering? How likely was that associated with illegal activities? Uh, what was the last exchange that it hit? How much KYC was done? Is this a, a coin that comes directly from mining? Has there ever been some KYC yeah, or, yeah. or any identity being done on that specific coin? And I really think that maybe in 15 years, it will be frowned upon if actually euros or dollars or Swiss francs are being used that are not connected to a blockchain with a transparent ledger. I really think that regulators are going to move faster than we can imagine and think because for a regulator, I mean, it's paradise. If I, if I know the source of funding for the last five hops and I know exactly what is my risk, so my risk score. So, Michael, from a Luxembourg perspective, again, I think what we're touching is an important topic is uh, if the regulator, my, my hypothesis is in the moment the regulator is in the driver's seat or very active, we're talking about business development of a location, a region, it's a competitive market. Uh, do you see that also for Luxembourg? Well, absolutely, yes. The, the, um, 
the, the regulator in Luxembourg is, has been progressive since the beginning of this for the last three or four yeah. years. They've had representatives on, the, on different working groups trying to understand how this works and how it's particularly going to affect the fund industry, which is the major industry of Luxembourg. As you said, it's got a huge effect when you start to disintermediate people in a business which is made up of, of intermediation. Um, so they're on top of this, certainly. They're looking at different projects. They're in it. I think all the regulators around the world, everybody's very interested in it. They're interested in it from two sides. How can they develop their financial systems, but also how they can protect the individuals, because m much of the function of regulation is protection of the yeah. small investor and all of this, and, and they're just as interested there, probably less so because it's not as not, not such a Wild West country. So, question on Joe to David, both, you're both coming from out of the U.S. When is the ESSC coming up to speed? I um, uh, don't want to say too much, but they're well up to speed. Um, uh, they, they have access to more information than we have access yeah. to, um, and uh, they have made statements to the effect that um, they hadn't seen a token launch that didn't have some aspects of a security. Mm -hmm. um, I'm confident uh, that uh, they are, will or are starting to understand uh, that there are tokens that uh, are utility tokens and would not be classified as securities. Uh, that said, I, th I think it's, uh, they have to wrap their head around the, the technology, but uh, I think it's business as usual for them. Um, they uh, are going to continue to ferret out fraudulent projects. Mm -hmm. uh, they are continue to <coughs> apply uh, Absolutely. The, the Howey test. So it's, uh, uh, we felt like we've had a good understanding um, of uh, what a token is with respect to securities law, and uh, we're increasingly confident. Uh, so at the end, finding the balance between innovation and protecting the consumer, the investor on the other side. David, is that? Yeah, so, so anyway, I mean, I, I happen to know the chairman of the SEC. He's a super mm -hmm. smart guy. He's got a great team. But like every other regulator, there's a balance. On the one hand, they have to move very quickly because they've never seen a market. There's never been a market that's evolved this quickly before. Last couple of months, no? But on the other hand, every decision they make has have implications. So they want to protect the retail guy, but they also don't want to blunt innovation in a way that could hurt their economy uh, relative to other countries. In places like the MAS, I'm on, I'm on their ITAP, which is their International Technology Advisory Panel, and they're extremely progressive. They also have an advantage in that they're a city state, yeah. so it's, it's a lot easier for them to, to move on on certain things, uh, uh, and the considerations and, and the implications are, are less. One thing I will say is that just a real quick comment on the central bank, we talked on about the impact on commercial banking. Most of the work done by central banks so far have looked at the broad macroeconomic issues related to the idea of central banks holding wallets and retail token issuance. For me, and what we've been talking to the banks about is, that, that, that is a big step forward because banks create money now the way, the way the monetary systems work in most countries. So disintermediating them has a massive effect. What we're focusing on is just getting a fiat representation on ledger so that we can support yeah. atomicity on DVP versus other assets. So before we um, finalize the, uh, close the discussion, one big question, joined to you. Do you see there's a new industry coming up called crypto asset management? Uh, because I see a lot of traditional, and Michael also, traditional bankers um, limited in their risk and compliance uh, ring fence area, moving out and setting up crypto hedge funds, uh, crypto funds, trading desk, capital market advisory. Michael, uh, during mm -hmm. the, is that is it becoming a new big business? It's going to be a big business. Obviously, as, people, as new assets come along, people want to invest in them and manage them and hold them and all of those sort of things. And, and all of that needs to be done in the custodial arrangements and, and within the system. I think where the big industry is going to come, though, is, is, is when we see retail investors being actually to invest directly into projects like they're doing with ICO. And at the moment, it's a problem because of the securities laws and things. They're not really geared up quite right for having small investors investing directly into companies or solicitation and things. I mean, if I want a small investor to invest in our venture fund, it's, it's, it's basically impossible. They, they can't yeah. do that. And why should that be impossible? Why should that be not just from the venture point of view, but in the funds? We can see a different form of fund management see, come along. We, right now, the, the whole market is pretty much dominated also by, by the retail uh, investors. Do you see the institutional investors are now, demand is coming up, and, yeah, yeah. and they try to get in the market. And, and challenge is, and please correct me, that building up their own infrastructure to manage the tokens, the currency, et cetera. Uh, is that, there a need that's to... That's not going to happen. 
No, no. The, the question is, the question exactly, exactly. is their bridge function. Bridge function, the asset manager become the custodian uh, yeah. for the institutional investors and try to bridge both the digital currency world, IC world, and the traditional institutional environment that is not willing to yeah, take on that I risk. I mean, ab absolutely, the risk of, the, of crypto yeah. at the moment is so huge that you'd be wanting to push that out to somebody else and insure it out onto somebody else at the moment. And not just, not, not least the, 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 the cybersecurity and, and the technical aspects of that mean that most asset managers that I know sitting in an office in, in Luxembourg or wherever wouldn't have a clue what to do yeah. with the thing if it showed up on the doorstep, if yeah. such a thing can show so up George, on the doorstep. So, George, they see yeah. that small investment banking boutiques are an asset manager that willing to take on that risk are seeing a blue ocean and try to get in? Um, so, it's not those kinds of that There are some of those entities. Yeah. Uh, the big concern, we speak with hedge funds, VCs, mm -hmm. hybrid yeah. VC hedge funds. Um, we've spoken with pension funds, some of the biggest yeah. in the world, and sovereign wealth funds. Uh, they are eager to expose themselves to uh, these kinds of risks, whether it's protocol level tokens or, or mm -hmm. assets on the blockchain. Uh, but they are scared, rightly so. It's still a, a fairly immature space. Uh, they need a very good narrative around the foundation, which is custody of these tokens. And so um, you worked with a, a gentleman named Alex Batlin uh, at UBS, and he moved on to BNY. Um, he joined us a while ago to build custody 2.0 to to give uh, ourselves um, security that the various uh, value tokens that we hold um, are uh, very rigorously safe and when we're comfortable with that uh, we're going to uh, move that to make that available to the world so it, it's going to be a small number of institutions that uh, that help the uh, bigger investors to um, so we are back, Peter, to the custody discussion of tokens? Well, I don't think custody of tokens is... <laughs> no, no, of custody, <laughs> custody environments custody, for tokens. Custody is actually very important, and we do talk, I think the industry talks quite sensibly about immutability. And immutability, the flip side of immutability, if you think about it, is provability. Mm -hmm. You can prove that that asset exists, and you can prove the quantity, and you can prove where it's come from, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Provability is a really vital concept in this whole arena. Of course, if it's distributed and it's on many different in many different places, then it makes it much more difficult to interfere with than it does in a traditional silo-based organization, you know, great big... Um, I won't name anybody in particular, but we all know these enormous custody banks. And I think that the answer to all of that is going to be brought out by simple things like, for example, I'm sure most people here are aware of the, I think it was the Dole Foods example, where there was a, a, a company that went private and uh, effectively uh, there was a, a tender offer and instead of receiving what they thought were going to be 100% of the shares, they got about 150% of the shares because there were shares out there in various custody banks that hadn't actually ever been deregistered or changed. So there was an enormous custody problem already. That can't happen in a distributed ledger environment. That's going to become very important. Mm. So that provability becomes the issue. Not, I think, immutability, although it's the flip side of the coin. Okay, final statement. I, Jim, I, I think the provability is sure. actually 10 times harder in the fiat world. If you just look at Tether, which is this weird kind of structured company that issues dollars out of the blue, um, there's so many people who say that there is a scam and that's an easy statement because it's, it's a statement. I think the hard way would be how could they prove it's not a scam mm -hmm. and uh, that would come down to provability. Listen guys, we have 1.6 billion dollars that we control. Obviously they can't prove that. They, they can't. So actually the answer but, but, to this but is that's it's because the money is in banks. So exactly. So no, the point is it's, it's actually a lot easier to actually prove that you have crypto because you can sign it and, and, and show it rather than to prove that you actually own fiat. So my point here is actually the custody is actually a really key kind of question and I think that's going to be something that many, many companies have to still solve. Um, and I think once this is solved, it's going to be way tr more transparent, way safer and easier to prove than with old assets. Okay, I think we are running out of, out of time. I think for me, uh, I think this was a very engaging um, discussion about uh, blockchain and uh, business model, cryptocurrencies, ICOs, 
the role of the regulator. I think all these topics, uh, I think, will you know will be in the center of our discussion going forward. I think uh, this year because I think the industry is going through a change. There's no question about it. it's a question about timing, uh, selective use cases being uh, moving into production this year, and I think we have the chance also tomorrow because there's a blockchain and uh, cryptocurrency track. Uh, uh, talking about custody, talking about blockchain technology. So we have an entire morning uh, um, um, time tomorrow to, to discuss. It would be great if you can join that. Before I do this, I want to thank Joe, David, uh, Julian, Michael, and Peter for a really engaging discussion and uh, uh, looking forward to uh, 2018. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.